Now I can. Okay. You got me? Yeah. Let me check my volume here. Make sure I can hear you. So, Lance Hoth, Hoth? Hoth Powell. Hoth Power. Yeah. It's Cajun, so it, it spelled all kinds of messed up. <laughs> so. People mess up my name all the time, but that's, that's, that's a good name, especially if you're power listening. Yeah, it, it actually comes in handy, I guess. Um, I'll flip raise my volume. So, uh, you know, it's funny. I just looking at your last post, and you called yourself a bench press specialist. Yeah. But I think I think if if you're squatting and deadlifting, you're a power lifter. Uh, yeah, I mean, I I don't compete in those because of my back. Uh, so I, I can't put up competition numbers. I do them in the gym just to keep the movements going. Uh, but I, I I might eventually do a competition with them if I can get my back uh, back up to full health again. But uh, mostly bench press in competitions. Hey, listen, just do what you can do. Don't yeah. Oh, don't worry about anyone else. <laughs> you know, if you, oh, man. you I, I, plates that's in your bench five hundred. Who cares? You know. <laughs> yeah. Well, not five hundred yet, but maybe someday. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely would love to. You're at 165s, right? Uh, I, I fight at one. I mean, I uh, compete at 181. At 181. Yeah. That's so. Uh, 181 is the top of the weight class. Uh, so I, I sit about. I sit normally I weigh about 190 and drop down to 181.8 for competition. 181s, I think. I think well, a lot of a lot of people I've heard. This is the most competitive weight class. Um, I think in the open division it is because it you know that's such a big age group, um, and it's a common weight for I guess guys. Yeah. Um, I'm in the mass the submasters, which you know it's only 35 to 39 years of age, so there's not a lot of us that compete. Um, so it's not super competitive, but generally guys in my weight class and my age group have really really high squats and deadlift numbers and their bench presses on spectacular numbers. Yeah. Um, whereas I've always been good at bench press, so my bench press is a little bit better uh, than most. Well, I think generally no one has like all three, you know? This yeah, it's very guys, real. There's some freaks yeah. that are good in all three, like Ed Cohn, you know, there's some freaks, but for yeah. the most part, usually people are good at two. Yeah. And my my deadlifts, I've been in the 500 on deadlifts. I've never squatted over 400 pounds. Yeah. Uh, so squats always been my weakest. Uh, and now it it because my back, I can barely you know I did 275, yeah 275 today. Um, and my back's kind of holding a little bit right now from it. Uh, that tends to be like the top of the weight for me in squats where I feel okay. Um, we did 315 a couple weeks ago, and it kind of put me down for like a week. I like pretty much for a week I didn't work out after that um so 275 seems to be the okay mark with my squads right now what organization do you lift in uh I currently lift with WUOP uh which is a smaller organization here in America but it's pretty big overseas yeah I know. Um, yeah I was looking into it yeah and then my next competition July 11th with is was is USPA uh so I'm transitioning to USPA uh, so your so your national record that's like that that's for both organ for that's just that's for WUOP that's the national record that's the national record in the one in the one eighty ones yes one eighty one some master yeah so what what was that bench that one my first one was three ninety one and then this last competition was three ninety six point eight. 396 at a 181 body weight and what what age i'm 38 and a half so, <laughs> that's a really good bench yeah especially in competition you know oh yeah you know, I, 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 yeah so there's plenty of guys who can say they you know do 400 pounds in the gym but it, you know it's not the same because the you know the 45 pound weights generally don't weigh 45 pounds uh, you probably bench in the gym 425 to 450 somewhere around there yeah i've hit 425 before is the most i've hit in the gym 
I've been, I've been yeah. this for a while, I know. <laughs> yeah. But that, you know, that's what the 45 pound weights, you put the calibrated weights on there and it's a total different story. Like they, they just feel different, weigh different. Um, and I actually had to learn that because I've only been doing powerlifting for about seven months now. That's uh, it? I, well, I've been, I've always lifted since I was 18. So I've been lifting for 20 years, but I've never like lifted like a powerlifter. I was a bodybuilder before that. So I, I kind of like lifted like a bodybuilder lifts. And so I've had to like retrain myself to bench press the way powerlifters bench press. This explains giant bench press and this is the, the smallest squat probably. Yeah. I mean, seven months. I've yeah, I, I, think, I think I started, so my first competition was last December and I started training for that in October. So I had like eight weeks to train for that one. And it was kind of a spur of the moment thing. Uh, I, I posted, uh, I just started back at the powerlifting gym. Yeah, uh, yeah. After being off from COVID and stuff. Uh, and I was working out at one of the uh, like box gyms, corporate box gyms, and went back to my powerlifting gym. And I hit full 15. And one of my buddies uh, was like, man, we got to get you on the platform to, to compete. Yeah. And uh, mm -hmm. I was just kind of joking. I was like, let's do it. And he's like, there's a competition December 12th. And I was like, oh, you're serious. <laughs> and uh, so he became my coach. He was, uh, Armando, he goes by Mondo. He's one of the top lifters in the world in his weight class. Uh, he's got world records, national records. Uh, so I trusted him to be my coach. And he's, you know, elevated my bench press beyond what it, like, a year ago, what I posted yesterday, I could not have done a year ago. Uh, you know, I did 335 for five sets of five yesterday, which there's no way I could have done it a year ago. It's so cool. Yeah. You've only been, I mean, I guess you, like you said, you've been bodybuilding for a uh, I, I'm doing a bodybuilding type program. Did you compete in bodybuilding? I did one competition when I was 35, uh, but I always, I've always had the bodybuilder kind of body. I've always trained like that. Um, I've always had super low body fat percentage. Uh, so, it, you know, bodybuilding workout and powerlifting workout, I don't care what anybody says, are not the same. Uh, no, no. And it's not the same kind of lifts. You don't have it like you're doing the same. Yeah, you're doing bench press, but you're doing two totally different styles of bench press. Yeah. Uh, same with squats, same with deadlifts. Um, it, I actually think I look better now doing my powerlifting workouts than I did when I was doing my, my bodybuilding workouts. Yeah. After, after a competition, I'll up the repetitions, you know, and yeah. do more, you know, like, a lot of reps, eight reps, a, a lot of cardio, you know, like, yeah. and, uh, you know, for a little while and then, you know, start focusing down towards the competition. That I, wanted yeah. to I, I, I did not, when I was competing in bodybuilding, I, I didn't like the lifestyle. Uh, and after the first competition I did, I decided like the lifestyle wasn't for me. I, I liked looking good still. And I wanted to have the body, but competition and that lifestyle just wasn't did was it what I wanted because it is a lifestyle and it absolutely consumes your life, uh, and it just wasn't for me. And I don't have the discipline food wise. Like I like to eat whatever I want to eat, uh, so I, I would eat what my coach had on plan and then eat so much more after that too. <laughs> your body is a, a, a whole lifestyle. You know, powerlifting is you go to the gym for, you know, an hour and a half and then you just, you live your life. Yeah, pretty much. Bodybuilding is like, you're always thinking about what you got to eat. Just, just, uh, I don't know how bodybuilders can look at chicken. Like, yeah, yeah. Oh, I, mean, I hated chicken and, and cod. Like, I think at one point for three weeks straight, every single meal, six days, of, six, six meals a day was cod and asparagus. Oh. And, 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 oh, it was like, you can only cook cod so many ways. <laughs> so, horrible. yeah, it was bad. But, you know, I will say this about bodybuilding, though, and the lifestyle. It elevates everything else in your life. You get so stringent and uh, dedicated to what you're doing that everything becomes, like, more dedicated to what you're doing. And you just elevate in such a way that you you hadn't before. So I'll say that about the bodybuilding lifestyle. It definitely elevates you in what you do. Yes. Yes. I would say all the lifting sports do that. 
Yeah, wow. athletes in general. Yeah, yeah. Spe especially lifting sports. And the difference with powerlifting, I think, is that where bodybuilding is where it's like you're always just kind of in the mindset of it. Powerlifting brings you to this laser focused, you know, like I'm going to do 405 today. You know, that's what I'm going to do. And that's all you have in your head. And then when yeah. you're training, and, uh, and then, uh, you know, I guess when <laughs> a lot of guys, when you knew where you psyched yourself out like that too, you could all, you could psych yourself out. Yeah. I'll be honest. Like I, I've always been able to lift pretty well, I think. Uh, but without having a coach to, you know, keep me on track and give me my plan every day, uh, I, I couldn't do it. And, you know, usually my, I've competed twice now. And then that week after competition, I kind of have a week off from lifting, just go do what you want to do in the gym, have fun, you know, don't lift anything heavy, just kind of, you know, hit whatever you want to. I, without having the plan in front of me now, I, I don't know how to work out. I'm like, what am I supposed to do? Like, is this too much weight? Is it too many reps? And, you know, I've gotten used to having that uh, heels you'll walk out. This is exactly what you got to do. Don't do anything else that's not on heel. If you miss a rep, redo it. <laughs> like, uh, so I've gotten used to it and I actually like it. I like the, uh, the uh, schedule of it. And part of that is because I have Asperger's, so I like to know exactly what I'm doing. Yeah, and yeah. this is my time frame. This is how long it's going to take me. And so it really helps because I used to just go to the gym and do whatever I want. Like I had, okay, Monday's chest day, you know, Tuesday's leg day, but I didn't have a plan on what I was doing. And now every day I've got that set. These are your reps. These are your sets. These are your exercises. And it's, it, it helps anybody who thinks they can do it without a coach. Maybe you can, but you'll be so much better if you get a coach. All right. All right. Does the lifting help with, I would guess, how would I put it? Um, I mean, when you're as large as you are, right? Like, do you feel less socially awkward because you could just, just basically break everyone in half that's around you? <laughs> so I actually didn't even know I had Asperger's until about three years ago. Um, I, I've had it my whole life, but I never got diagnosed as a kid. I got diagnosed three years ago doing marriage counseling uh, with a psychiatrist. Um, and he just kind of figured it out over about a year of seeing me. Uh, he kind of like figured out, okay, something's not exactly right with this guy. Um, he seems to not have emotions. And finally he pieced it together and then did a test and sure enough, I had it. And so I... I got really good as a kid learning how to mimic people in social situations. Um, and most of it is just mimicking. I don't really have the emotions. I know how I'm supposed to act and supposed to feel. Um, and so I will do that, even though I don't actually feel that way, uh, just because it's a social norm. Uh, but at the gym, I am, I, I'm just open at the gym. I talk to everybody. I'm friendly with people. To me, I don't feel like I'm faking it. Um, and I just generally get along with, so like, it's at the gym, like that totally like kind of fades away. Yeah. Uh, and it's all about the lifting. Like, you know, for me, there's no emotion in the lift. If I miss a lift, I miss it. Like it's not emotional to me. Uh, but if I get a big lift, yeah, I'm joyful. Like, <laughs> so, uh, and I, I don't, cause I've never considered myself a big guy. Like I'm, you know, I'm 191 right now at five foot eight. Um, I graduated high school. I was 130 pounds. So I was a small guy when I graduated high school. Um, so I still have that kind of mentality that I'm not a big guy. And I usually don't even realize how big I am until I'm standing next to somebody who I think is big. And I see in the mirror that I'm bigger than they are. And I'm like, well, holy crap. Like, I didn't realize I was this big. <laughs> well, I saw yeah. just below your head is your traps and your deltoid. Just yeah. come out, like, this is a big dude. Don't mess with this guy. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I I really don't even think about it most days about, you know, everybody says I'm big and uh, I just never really like think about it. Uh, and I, I know I have a temple, but I've learned to control that and 
Uh, I know jujitsu. I know Muay Thai. I've never had to fight anybody at the club or the street. I've had guys try to fight me before, um, but generally my friends would, you know, jump in and stop that from happening. Uh, but, you know, I've never actually had to like physically fight anybody That's outside cool. of being at a competition or something. Uh, and I don't want to fight nobody. I don't, I don't like to hit people. I don't like to, you know, get into altercations. I try to avoid situations like that just because one, I don't generally like to be around people anyway, because uh, my ass bogles. Uh, so I try to stay within like a small, you know, group of people. Uh, but it, you know, people just generally don't piss me off that much. Uh, I kind of just like take it and go, okay, whatever. Well, that's just their situation. Let them be pissed and I'm going to go do my own thing. You know, it's yeah. in the marriage counseling, that's where you found this out because in marriage counseling it's like where like the therapist was like i think you need to see a psychiatrist and like so i went to see a psychiatrist and or treat me for depression and different things and then eventually they were like oh you got bipolar disorder yeah yeah and it's something that you probably had no idea you ever had growing up and no i guess i had no idea that i had it but now that i look back and all like the stupid things i did i'm like "Mm, that makes sense see the same thing happened to me once he you know, figured out I had it, told me I had it, and then told me, you know, the symptoms of it and how it works. I was like, that explains so much from my childhood. <laughs> like, and my, my family, they were all like, yeah, that makes sense. Like, all, all the things that, I, and I'll be honest, I look back now and I was probably a horrible kid growing up. Like, I, I understand now, like, how stressful it must have been for my parents. And then not knowing I had it and had they got me diagnosed, how different things could probably could have been. So, right, so right. when you were a little kid, like, or well, maybe you're not that, you know, how old are you now? I'm 38. So I'm on 38 also. Um, I guess the things were a little better when we were younger, but like yeah. my brother's in his mid forties and he's deaf and he's got some mental uh, disability issues and like, they had no programs for him. Like, yeah. the, like now, if he was like born now, oh, they so much stuff. Yeah, so much stuff. And I have a buddy that he, he doesn't listen to a podcast. He doesn't even know how to use his phone. But like, um, he's in his, I think, more he's sixty-five, and he's got he's got I don't know what he's got autism or Asperger's or something. He's he's got some issue that like if he was younger, they would have been able to like you know, do some stuff with him and help him out and make him do better in school, you know? But instead, they just kept leaving him back and sending him to summer school and his parents were <laughs> getting mad at him, you know, because they, they couldn't go on vacation in the summer. And yeah. he just needed a little bit of help. And so, like, uh, I've got a speech impediment. I've had it since I was a baby. Uh, and so they put me in speech therapy pretty much when I got to first grade. Um, and so the, everybody always thought, oh, it's just a speech impediment. That's why he doesn't talk to people. That's why he's not social. He just doesn't want to talk because people make fun of him. In reality, it was the asphalt goes, and I just didn't want to talk to people. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. I love talking. I love communicating. Uh, I love teaching. Uh, I've, you know, I've talked on stage before. And in those settings, I have no problem in those settings. It's in small group settings that, you know, the classroom, uh, I own my own business, so not in my business particularly, but when I was younger, I worked, worked for other people and we had group meetings and stuff. And in those situations, I don't like to talk because it's close to, you know, it's close. You got to like look at people in the eye. You can't look past them. And so those situations, I just wasn't ever comfortable in. Um, but no problem talking in big situations because I don't have to look at anybody particularly. I can just look past them, uh, it's, you know, keep moving my head. And uh, so... Those situations were fine, but I guess, you know, growing up, they just always thought, oh, it's a speech impediment, and it never really got any farther than that to, well, maybe he's actually got another issue, uh, which, you know, it's fine. I, I grew up fine and had friends and graduated, you know, high school, graduated college, on my own business now. It didn't hold me back any, uh, but I guess in the relationships, it probably would have helped to know, <laughs> you know. Because those are, I, I was, you know, probably an asshole to a bunch of people and they probably didn't dissolve it. And it wasn't that I was trying to be an asshole. I just, you know, don't know how to act in those situations. And so, you know, that 
is you know the kind of way it came off. What business do you own? I own a landscape company. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, I've done that. I've owned my own business now for eleven years. Uh, my dad owns a landscape company, so I learned. I grew up doing it, uh, so I learned how to do that. And then I uh, got a degree in psychology, hated psychology, and then opened my own landscape business because I just knew it and I'm good at it and I enjoy doing it. Uh, and so it's thriving, been really busy this year. Uh, and so I just, you know, I enjoy doing it. And I, I don't have to do cardio because all I do all day is cardio. So, <laughs> so how do you manage uh, your family life, your business life and the lifting? How do you, how do you get the lifting in? Um, so only my own business is, you know, I kind of make my own schedule if I want to. Um, uh, I've got two. Uh, I've got two sons here that live with me, and one son that lives with his mom out of state. Um, so the two, my two youngest boys, they go to daycare during the day. Um, I'm usually gone before they even get up in the morning, or as I'm leaving, they're getting up. Uh, I I've set my schedule to where we will only work from seven a.m. to three p.m. Uh, we don't really take a lunch break. Uh, we just walk, eat as we go. We'll get our eight hours in for me and my guys. And then uh, I've got the afternoon to work out. Uh, and it gives them the afternoon to do whatever they want to do too. Uh, and it's Texas, so it gets pretty hot in the afternoons. So we just try to get, you know, done before three or four o'clock. And then that gives me my time to be at the gym for two hours. And uh, I work out usually five days a week, usually Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I take off, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then Sunday, I take off. Who part of Texas, man? Uh, Houston. How many guns do you own? I've only got the. I've only got one. <laughs> I've got one. That they know of. <laughs> Texans. Yeah, I've got friends who have a lot. I've only got one. I uh, I don't mind guns, but I, I don't need to have a big arsenal of guns and stuff. I don't think. Uh, I, I you know I think at some point we probably will need to have more because of the way things are going right now, but. New York, uh, New York State won't let me have one. Yeah, it is, that's why I don't live there. All California, all Illinois, yeah, yeah. All, all those communist states. So. I was a police. I was in the NYPD for 13 years. Oh wow! And uh, is it because of the bipolar disorder they want to let you have one? Mm -hmm. Oh man, and that sucks because you probably could be perfectly fine with one and not have an issue. Nothing. Not everyone. No one. A lot of people don't believe me. They they ask me. They're like, what What happens? Like. Yeah. They, you know, I'm like, I'm like, nothing happened. I was like, they, you know, they do random drug tests. And when they did the drug tests, they, you know, they you put down what you're taking. And then from the last drug test to this drug test, I, you know, I happened to see a psychiatrist. I went on medications and they were like, well, we need your gun and you have to go see the psychiatrist. Oh, and, wow. Like that, that just sucks. Yeah. And then they, they died. They diagnosed me with bipolar one and they were like, yeah, that's, you gotta go. So. <laughs> <laughs> but pretty much you like lost your career at that point and had to start over doing something else i yeah i'm 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 right now trying to start over uh let me tell you that that first that i was like a whole year i was just so like i don't know like how to explain it to like to you like if somebody asked you like who you are like i don't think you would answer i'm a lawnmower man like, you know what I mean? Like, no. but when you're a police officer. That's your identity. Like, oh, oh, Mike's a cop. They don't go, you know, Lance is a, a landscaper. It's just, it's different. Yeah. You know, and they just, it, they, oof, they just took it. And that's crazy because they just diagnosed you with a mental disorder, basically. And then they take everything away from you thinking like, oh, that's going to help. They don't <laughs> It's just covering in their ass. That's all. Yeah. They, yeah. They, they're just worried that they don't care. If, they just, they're just worried that if something happened to happen and like the press or whatever found out that he, uh, he was diagnosed with this and didn't, they, they just didn't do anything. It, you know, if it was something questionable, it would just look bad for them. Yeah. So, you know, it's all, it's just covering their ass. I mean, in the end, it's not the worst thing. I mean, I get my top bag. I left at 13 years and I get 50% of my pay for the rest of my life and my health care. 
Oh, uh, yeah. Well, then you didn't you didn't totally luck out. <laughs> I didn't totally luck out, but like, you asked me a little lot like, that after it after it happened. Yeah, it was. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I still like you know if if I woke up tomorrow and the state said, "Hey, you can't landscape anymore because of this reason," I'd be like, "Well, what the crap am I gonna do?" <laughs> like, that was a harsh one too. Like I applied for my pistol permit. And the, on the letter that the judge wrote to me, he said he denied me because I'm a mental defect. Wow. He didn't even say I have a mental defect. He said you, you are a mental defect. Wow, that's... I was like, I wanted to find this judge. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, that's been, like, they treat you like a criminal and you're not. Like, you know, it's just crazy. Like, just absolutely just doesn't make sense. Yeah. And to me, like, I was like, I did everything proper. I was like, we're going to a therapist. She said, see the doctor. I saw the doctor. He said, you should take this medicine. I said, I, I, I did what they said. And I never did anything wrong, but yeah. now uh, I have time to do this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you know what I wanted to mention to you? Yeah. Strict curl. What is it? The strict, you know, the strict curl. Okay. It's, it's an event. And well, in 100% raw, I know they have meats down in Texas. Um, it's it's basic. It's a curl ba- with your back on the wall. Yeah, I've seen them. Oh, you see, you know what I'm talking about, right? You would probably be a good strict curler. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't do a whole lot of bagel calls. Uh, it's you'd be it's surprised if you if if you someone teaches you how to do them right. It is a lot of chest and back and it's not just it's not like the seated call. It's yeah, it's not like like basically like like you're just coming like this, right? You, okay. You're coming like this, you tucking your shoulders and then you, you you bring like it's like it's a it's yeah. a whole body movement up. You know, it's it's. It, it takes a little while to get used to the movement, but it's a, a big bench presser like you. I, I'm sure you're doing tons of arms when you're bodybuilding. You probably well, mostly mostly uh, triceps. I, I work out a couple bicep exercises just to keep them pumped, uh, but it's mostly tricep stuff. Um, and I don't know. If that's to me that that seems like it's an injury waiting to happen. Like, yeah. <laughs> like because i i've seen some of the guys like I, I know it's like a big thing now like uh it just recently like they just recently started doing it in competition yeah. so i've seen a lot of the uh the big old strong men kind of doing them yeah. and you know they're doing 200 like i saw a guy who was trying to do 250 pounds today now that you mentioned it i, I remembered and uh he didn't get it but it i mean it looked like he tore his biceps off like it just Is looked like curl or a strict curl it, it, I'm not sure. It, it may be a power curl is when you're standing up. He was uh, he was sitting down. Oh, sitting down. Yeah, I get. I, I don't remember. I just remember seeing him trying to do it, and uh, I was just like, "Why?" <laughs> like, well, okay, I do do that. I do that, but you know how like you, someone will do like a, like a bench, um, uh, you know, and they're doing boards on the press, right? Yeah. yeah. The same thing for, for, for if you're doing, a, if you're doing a, like strict curls, it's basically like doing half the curl. That's why. Okay. It's the top end of it. Yeah. I mean, I, I probably could do it. I, I'm pretty strong in general with most lifts. Uh, but I, I, for me, I try to, you know, avoid injury in my body anymore. You know, especially at this age, we don't heal like we used to. No. Although I have been getting, you know, all of a sudden I'm noticing I'm getting some strength gains. Yeah. Lately. And you said you're 38. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm feeling it, pretty good lately. Yeah. It, it's weird. Like I, I'm, you know, even though I guess we'll consider middle age, middle age, um, I'm way stronger than I ever was when I was 18 or 20. Uh, I feel like I'm only getting stronger in everything I'm doing. Uh, and so, you know, I, I could probably compete in the open class if I wanted to and probably still win in bench press. 
just because most guys my size on hitting 400 pounds on bench press. Uh, but if you know, you, I know I can't. What? If you're specializing just in the bench, right? Yeah. How many days a week are you benching? Or are you doing chest uh, exercises? Monday and Friday is one of my bench press days. Okay. Because so I was wondering, I was like, you know what? If you're just doing – if you're not worried about the squat and the deadlift, I was like, could you pull off three days a week? Uh, when I was younger, I used to bench press three days a week. Um, but right now it's just Monday and Friday. But my other workouts, my leg workouts and my back workouts, like my squat day and my deadlift day, everything revolves around increasing my bench press. All the movements are to either help my hip drive I help get my uh, my back title and uh, have that spring action off the press. Uh, so everything I do is designed to increase my bench press, even though I'm not bench pressing that day. I gotta send you. Uh, uh, I'll send you on Instagram this this guy's account, Ramsey Goggs. He's in Iraq. Okay. He's uh, he's young. He's oh, college age. His back literally forms like the shape of a U. It's incredible. The arch you can get into. It's insane. Oh. And he's 130 pounds. I just saw him pull his 350. That's insane. He's That's insane. almost three times his body weight. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's just crazy. Too. Yeah. But yeah, he's yeah, 130 pounds. Yeah. And I, I am not a fan of that super arc that people do. Like, I don't like it. it, it, oh, yeah. it and I know in competition it's legal. Uh, I think there should be a separate category for it myself. Uh, Tippy toe benching. Tip toe? Yeah. I, I bench on my tip. I bench on my toes. Now it's tippy toe benching. So, yeah, that's like, okay, well. Here's the thing, right? It just depends on when you started lifting, right? Like I started lifting in 2001, powerlifting. That was like my first time like I competed. So like, like I was around before raw was a thing. Yeah. Like, yeah. like raw, raw started in like the, the the term raw started in 1999. Uh, by um. Oh my God. Um, not Ed Coon. Uh, Paul Bossy. He and it was Raw Inc. And they started off with that organization that turned into 100% Raw. And <laughs> Raw, Raw actually stands for Redeemed Amongst the World. <laughs> It never stood for uh, raw. Yeah, we think it stands for, yeah. It was a Christian uh, thing, and um, and man, it 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 took off like probably around like 2016, I would say. Like, yeah, it's uh, you know, I know the the that organization out of Chicago, uh, that uh, oh, what gym is that in Chicago? Uh, they had a Netflix documentary about them. I can't, they'll, they'll huge, they get huge numbers, but they almost exclusively do equipped stuff, equipped bench press. Um, and I, I don't have anything against equipped bench press. I, you know, I, I probably could be amazing at it if I did it. Um, I just like to know that I'm doing this all on my own, no equipment, you know? Yeah. Well, all right. So, he, right. Like my coach, in college, right? He started lifting in 1974, right? He started the team in 1978. And back in the, in this, in the 70s, 80s, and put close to the late 90s, there was no such thing as lifting without a suit on. And yeah. There was no such, it was just, that wasn't a thing. Like, if, if you lifted without, a, uh, a suit on like that people would have everyone in the competition would have thought you were crazy they would have been like you're gonna kill yourself you're gonna die yeah. like that's what happened really when they started like these raw lift things like people were like you're crazy it's not gonna be a thing you get yeah you're nobody gonna... wants to see like we're putting up 700 pounds nobody wants to see y'all do 300 <laughs> from what i hear it really wasn't even just that it was just that people really thought that they were gonna get hurt 
like legitimately. I mean, because it's been a thing, you know, since I mean, I don't know. Well, they there were really no suits in the fifties, maybe in the sixties a little bit, but you know, it was just how you power lifted. Yeah. And uh, and then these guys, you know, a couple organizations in like the late nineties ran like raw, raw meets here and there. Right, it was like a special thing. Yeah. But when we started it in like the early two thousands, um, our coach he would have had us all lifting in suits and and wraps and all that stuff. Uh, the problem was that he had a team of thirty kids, and most of them didn't have the money to buy the stuff. Yeah. You know, let alone go to the competition and, you know, because it's not a, it's not a team sport. It's a club thing. And they gave us like a thousand dollars for like 30 people to go to like uh, overnight, you know, (laughs) it's, you know, it wasn't going to cut it. So we just basically lifted raw because we we didn't have the money to do it, but we really didn't know either or. I mean, the, the first meet that I went to with the team, which was the second meet was theirs. We went to a USAPL meet. This is two, this was in 2001. Mo, I think almost everyone there never even heard of anyone lifting raw. They thought we were out of our minds. <laughs> they did. They really, they thought we were out of our minds. They thought that like, we never, we didn't know what we were doing. And we actually did pretty well. Army was there, Navy was there, uh, Penn State was there. We beat them all. Raw. Wow. And we, we did really well. Not, not because of my help. <laughs> <laughs> but um but yeah then um all of a sudden like crossfit became huge and then after what happened was all these crossfitters that came that you know got you know learned a little bit and left the sport of crossfit and started powerlifting they didn't want to do the whole you know canvas suits and denim suit shirts or i don't even know what they're using now and uh yeah, that's when Raw blew up, like all the from all these CrossFit people. Interesting, I didn't know that. Yeah, that's and um, there's some Olympic gyms too. Like we talked to some like uh, uh, Olympic uh, coaches, same thing. Like that, that sport would be would be dead if it wasn't for CrossFit. Yeah, I'm not a big CrossFit fan, but but if they helped. If they, I I could see how they would cross over to other sports. Uh, and, you know, it, it's a huge group of people. So if you have a mass, you know, group coming over into something else and they've got followers, then, yeah, it would definitely elevate a sport. If it was, yeah, if it wasn't for CrossFit, powerlifting, it is, it's such a big, I mean, you might not think it's a big sport, but compared to what it was, like in the late 90s, it's a giant sport now. Yeah. There's a lot. I'll be, I'll be honest, like, I've followed bodybuilding for a long time. And, you know, I can name all the big bodybuilders and whatnot. You know, I never really followed powerlifting uh, up until a couple of years ago. And, you know, that's when, you know, and I was more followed strongmen like Eddie Hall and, you know, Thor and all those guys. Uh, but powerlifting, I was never like, never really piqued my interest because even though I was strong, I was a bodybuilder. Boring. Uh, and yeah, it is kind of boring. If you're not involved in it, it's it, it's a boring sport. It's a boring sport. The, listen, meat organizers have been trying forever to try and get it to be interesting or exciting and trying to get people to come that aren't that lifting in the meat or their mothers or fathers or wives, you know, like just it it takes all day. Nobody wants to sit there all day and watch watch that. Yeah, and no. you know, my my first competition was in, like I said, last December. Uh, you know, COVID was still going on, so we couldn't really have a bunch of spectators. Didn't really have a bunch of competitors. I think we got the whole competition done in three hours, uh, so it was pretty much in and out real quick. This last competition, we started lifting at 10 a.m. and didn't finish till 4 p.m. And most people don't want to sit there and just watch people lift for that long. The only thing I could see some people wanted to watch is if you had a competition and you limited it to like 30 people 
and you had just phenomenal people lifting and it was just crazy numbers for a couple hours just because that's what people want to watch yeah the other this is like the the issue also is that right like my wife weighs 103 pounds right she deadlifts over 250 that's a lot it's a lot of weight right but people don't see people want to see a thousand pounds go up you yeah know? even if the guy weighs 500 pounds yeah, that's what they want to see. They want to see the thousand pounds go up, right? So that's a, so it that's the weird thing like with powerlifting. It's like you can have like like Wilkes wise or just just you know some amazing lifting going on, but no one cares. Yeah. No one cares. They people just want to see the big numbers, yeah. you know? Or they want to like, you know, they, they want to see you benching. Yeah, a couple of weeks ago there was a uh, competition here in the Houston area. It was all equipped bench presses, and their their thing was every single person here is going to bench over a thousand pounds. Yeah, it's all equipped. Yeah, and I mean that is impressive, but to me, I'm like, yeah, but you've got a full ply shirt on. Like, what are you doing without that? Like I want to, I, that's what I want. Like to, to me, that's what matters. Like you, the equipment's lifting that, not you. And I'm not dogging mm-hmm. anybody for lifting the equip. Don't take me wrong. I know that's their the way they lift, and that's cool. That you know, do you? But I am an unequipped bencher, and I think it's more impressive than 180 pounds. I'm putting up 400 than a 350 pound guy doing 800 with equipment. Like I think it's more impressive that I can do 400 at my weight. I know a lot of very good lifters that lifted in the 90s with single ply suits on and wraps and stuff like that that are lifting now that are competitive and they compete raw and and they're they got the, the same mindset they're just like I don't I don't need all that you know yeah. like um and it, and it switched it yeah. switched a long time ago everybody was impressed by the equipped lifters and it was cool to watch those big numbers, but now it's flipped and people want to see the wall lift those because it's like, that's, you know, that's the person doing that. The equipment's not helping them. They're doing it on their own. And uh, yeah, I to a raw meat, not raw meat, I'm sorry, an equipped meat a long time ago. Like when I first started lifting, um, I went with, uh, you know, Pat Susco. I've heard the name, but I don't know him. Like he was on, like back when there were magazines, you know, the cover of Powerlifting Mag- USA, uh, he squatted 925 back in like 1992, which was huge back then. It's crazy. Like that's a, that's crazy amount back then. Yeah. So that's, that's still a lot now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, anyway, so I went to a meet with him out to this place, Iron Island in Long Island, New York, and uh, watched this equipped meet. And I kept seeing guys after guys bomb out of the meat because they couldn't touch their chest. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? They bring it. Yeah. They, they, yeah. It's so tight and you just can't come down all the way. I was like, this is the, the weirdest thing I've ever seen. I'm like, I don't want to lift like this. I was like, you have to have enough weight on the bar even to get it to touch your chest and then. Co- yeah. Yeah. I was like, this, this is, this is bizarre. And I mean, I've used a slingshot before in training uh you know to overload the ball and you know test myself but i wouldn't throw like i've seen guys on instagram like oh i bench press 350 pounds a day a new pr and they got a slingshot on and to me it's like that's not a pr dude like <laughs> it's just not like and you know what too well i when when, pe- when people say like oh i, I my best squad is 400 or 500. I'm like, was that at a meet? Yeah. <laughs> it's that, 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 I mean, that's kind of my mindset now too, is like, yeah, you'll lift at the gym is impressive, but that's not a competition lift. And I'm not dogging anybody. I don't want to, you know, get a bad rep for dogging people. But when you compete, you think, you think differently about lifts. That's when, what I'll say. When you did takes balls to get up on the platform, and then it's not easy to to be up there with all that pressure, and then listen to remember all your signals, and to, to do the weight also on top of that. It's it's a it's a lot. 
Yeah. And, you know, most people I've, you know, I know people who are really good lifters who miss all three lifts because they can't handle the pressure and they, they, you know, they don't wait for the pause command. They don't wait for the down command. They don't wait for the rack command. Uh, it's just the pressure of being on stage. You're just nervous and they, they, they mess up and I've missed lifts. Uh, I've never missed a call. I've just missed lifts because, you know, either the weight was too heavy. Like this last competition, I missed my very first lift. It was 386 pounds. Easy lift for me. Should not have been an issue. Uh, and something just, my I started lifting. My shoulder was like, not today. And uh, I missed the lift. I My next lift, I did, I did the same weight the next lift, and it flew up, no problem. Just like... Easy, like how did I miss that the first time? But you know, it just happens. You miss lifts sometimes, and you know, co in competition, it's different. Like you know, if you, you know, I guess you can happen in squat and deadlift too. But on bench press, you know, if you don't set right, you're an inch farther up than you normally are. You're gonna miss your lift. Hey, you you know what else happens? I mean, I haven't really been competing that long, but you get miss loads. Yep. Have had that happen to you? I have not had that happen to me. Maybe. I have done it. My, I've done it myself in practice and training with kilograms because I can't add it up right. I, but. In training, I, I call myself like. Actually, I want to name the podcast "Miss Loaded" because I <laughs> all the time. But but in competition, you know, you go. I, I got crushed under a squat once, and I was like, "What the heck happened?" And they're like, "Oh, that was for the other guy." And I was like, "Ah," oh. and then they were like, "Okay, you, know, you can do it." You yeah. be doing what? But at that point, you're done. <laughs> like, yeah. So yeah, this yeah, it's all different things that can happen at a competition. I think I, I think that happened at the last competition I was at. Somebody got misloaded, um, and he was not happy. He was extremely pissed off about it. Um, yeah. But it, it happened, you know. They'll it they'll hear me. Paid with like a subway sandwich and a soda, you know, yeah. to, to load all day. You know, you can't get mad at them. No, it's not their fault. It happens. Uh, but I mean, everybody misses lifts now and then. If, if you know, if you just missed your lift, if you just get nervous, um, you know, sometimes you just have a big head and you start off with too high of a number. And I did this in the gym, so I know I can do it here. And yeah, it's not the same. <laughs> I'm very stubborn with five. Five, I got to be able to do it for five, you know, yeah. to, to, to open with it. And that's what, uh, you know, we'll, right now we're doing increments of five on my uh, my training right now. We, you know, last week we did 325 for five sets of five. This week we did 335 for five sets of five. Um, we'll probably woke up all the way to 365, 375 before competition. And then I'll probably, I'm hoping to hit 410 at the next competition. That's, that's my goal weight for this competition. Uh, I, I think I've got it in me. I think I can do it. Uh, what? How long away? How, how long? Seven, seven weeks out. Seven weeks out? Yeah. And what are you doing right now? 375, five? Uh, my last competition was 396 is what I hit. No, no, but what are you training right now? What you like? Uh, I did Friday. I did dead press with three seventy five for six sets of one. You did six singles. Yeah. Wow, that's a lot. Oh, uh, you know that's dead press. That's coming down. I was coming down like two inches off my chest, hitting the balls. It stopped there, and then pressed it off the ball. Yeah. Uh, for six sets, which I mean it. That, that's crazy heavy like that's hard to do because that's usually your stopping point you know you you're pushing and you hit that stop yeah um, so we'll try to like work to where i don't have that stop anymore but it's just going to go past it uh i just started doing um pin presses with the bench the first time yeah, I ever started. yeah pin press dead press the same thing yeah like you got you chain with chain do you train with the uh, chains or bands uh, last, the last competition I did for the first couple of weeks, uh, and then we switched over to just wait, uh, this time I haven't trained so far yet for this next one with bands. I actually like the bands. I think they help a lot. Um, 
but we, we haven't trained this time with them. We'll, we're focusing more on uh, really getting past that sticking point, uh, which we know exactly where it's at in my bench. So we know exactly where to set the pins at to, to get past that point. Um, and so that's what we're really working on. Yeah, right. I mean, my shoulders need a break from this stuff, but I got four more weeks of this competition. Yeah, four more benches. And uh, yeah, these pin presses, because I have it set, you know, just exactly at my chest, you know? Yeah. And then I got 100 pounds of chains. So I got, you know, 50 pounds of chains on each side. And then I'm using the, um, the, uh, the green band, too, wrapped up. And man, it's brutal at the top. Yeah, you know, it's like you know, I, I come off, uh, and it just it gets so heavy at the top. So it's the, you know, chains I think are a little different than bands because like chains are like a like progressive the weight, but the bands are like like exponential. I think like that the, like when you get to the tippy top with the band, like that last inch is <laughs> painful. It is, but it, it helps a lot. And I know, like I had never trained with bands before until a couple months ago. And uh, I realized, wow, that this actually is extremely helpful. And uh, I had never understood why people did it, but after I started training them, I was like, okay, yeah, I like this, and it, it helps a lot. And uh, I don't know, it's, it's a different feel, and it also helps keep you in that that groove where you need to be at if you have them set right. Uh, yeah. We all have that groove that we like in our bench press, uh, so it definitely helped with that. So if you could start your bodybuilding over, right? Would you would just would you want to be a powerlifter? If, if I could go back to the 18-year-old me, yeah. Because I think the first time I ever hit 315 was when I was 18. Uh, and I was, you know, 135, 140 pounds. If I could go back and know what I know now. I probably would have started powerlifting in 2001 when I graduated high school. Yeah. I probably would have went straight into powerlifting as a bench press specialist. And then probably would have, like, I, I didn't even deadlift for the first time until like four years ago. Like I never deadlifted until like four years ago. And then I, I quickly was hitting 500 pounds on deadlift. Like I never knew how strong I was on deadlift because I never did it. But, you know, being in landscaping, pushing wheelbarrows, picking up, you know, 80 pound sacks of concrete and uh, sod and mulch and everything. Like it just really translated well into my deadlift. And I had not got injured in my lower back. I, I think I'd probably be doing 600 pounds on deadlift right now. What happened? Um, one of my buddies owns a uh, karate school yeah. and I do jujitsu. Uh, so he had me come and train with his students. And after the uh, jujitsu class, his kids were like, hey, why don't you come kick, you know, the big Bob doll thing that you kick? And I was like, okay. So I, I was kicking it and just misstepped and tore my groin muscle. Um, and that, that put me down for like a year. Uh, and then I finally, I was still bench pressing, but couldn't squat, couldn't deadlift. That finally healed up, uh, started squatting and deadlifting again. And then I did some sandbags at the gym and picked one of them up and threw it over my shoulder. And I thought at the time I got an ahonia from it. And so for about six months, I went thinking I had a honia. Uh, and then uh, got up one day, was walking around, started puking blood up. And I was like, okay, well, I guess this honia finally like blew open or something or something major happened. So I went to the emergency room and they're like, well, good news. You don't have a honia, but you've got two bulging discs in your back that are sticking about two inches in. And it was, it was actually making you bleed? Yeah, I was throwing up blood because I, just from the pain, the pain was making me throw up blood. Oh. Uh, and so... Uh, at that point I was like, okay, I guess I need to go see, you know, a specialist, went to a chiropractor, got aligned, uh, got, you know, pulled apart, all that jazz and, uh, slowly started the process of getting that healed. Uh, that was, I guess a little over a year ago that I started seeing the chiropractor. Um, and then my bench, I was still bench pressing, but wasn't deadlifting or squatting. 
Uh, and so I, I still have the pain in my lower back. It's not as bad as it was. Uh, squats, definitely. I feel like I do squats. Deadlifts don't bother me as much anymore, but I'm still like, I think the last time I deadlifted, I did full 65. Uh, so I'm still not like, I could probably get back up in the higher numbers, but I'm not trying to, you know, get injured doing it. Uh, and I switched over to sumo. I used to do conventional. Now I do sumo because it's a little bit easier on my back. Uh, so I'm actually transitioning into learning how to do sumo the correct way. And I feel like I could, I could compete in deadlift, uh, and probably be competitive once I really train myself to learn how to do sumo and get it like dialed in. Like I have my bench press dialed in, but I'll never compete with, with squats. I already know that I'll do push, pull. I'll never do squats. Yeah. My deadlifts look disgusting. But uh, you should, my wife, she's got beautiful, she, she does sumo. She looks like, I don't know how to describe it. She looks like a sumo rocket ship. Like, just like, it looks <laughs> right. Yeah. And I always, I'll be honest. I always made fun of sumo lifters. I was like, oh, that's cheating. That's BS. But now that I do it, I'm like, you know what? I, I actually think it's harder than a conventional deadlift. It, it just uh, depends on on your body you know like you know, like your torso length you know like your femur length on like which one's going to be easier for you and harder for you you know like you know i tried for a while to do sumo because i had a problem my back curling over so it was easier with the sumo position to hold my back straight but lately i've, I've been pulling sumo more because now my back is stronger now and i just feel stronger in that 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 conventional position you know, like for me, for sumo, I, I don't know. I just don't feel comfortable with it. Yeah. Unless I do my, my awful form. Unless <laughs> I do, you know, where my hips pop right up and like, you know, I unroll my back. You know, if I do that, <laughs> then. Uh, and, and, you know. Somehow, somehow I could pull in like the mid fours like that. I, it, I don't know how when I look at it, it, it doesn't, it looks like my back's going to snap in half, but. I was like, I used to warm up sumo and then after about 325, I would switch over to conventional because uh, I just couldn't, I couldn't pull sumo any heavier than that. Uh, but then when I decided, you know what, I, I got to switch. It's too bad for my back. It's too painful to pull heavy weight that way. Uh, I, you know, I made the switch to just sumo. I, I progressed pretty quickly and I think I was scheduled to do like full 15 in my workout. And my coach was like, if it feels light, go ahead and jump up uh, and jump up on weight if you want to. And so I pulled it and it came up pretty easy. And I'm pretty sure he meant jump up by like 10 pounds. But I was like, you know what? I feel good. Let's do this. I threw full 65 on and I pulled it. And uh, pulled it up sumo, and I was extremely surprised because I, I did not think I was going to be able to do it. Yeah. Uh, but it, it came up surprisingly fast and easy. And I was like, man, I, I'm really powerful with this. But we had already said that I'm doing bench press this competition. So we backed off of deadlifts because I was probably going to end up holding myself, continuing to go up. Yeah. But uh, I think I'm going to do this. I'm, this next competition is a national qualifier for IPL in November, which they're doing here in Houston. Uh, so I'm qualifying for bench press. I'm pretty sure. I don't think I'm going to have an issue winning the competition and getting qualified. Uh, and then going to nationals. Uh, and then probably next year, I might start deadlifting in competitions. Uh, but this year mainly is just focused on the bench press. Because I, I really want to get I want to have my national records in uh Ruop, Ruop, and I'd like to eventually have the national record in USPA also yeah and uh I think I can do it I think the record right now is like 442 is what it is I think I've got the potential to, to beat that um the world record's crazy there's some guy in Poland right now doing 465 pounds yeah uh, in, in my weight class and my age which Man, I have to, that, that seems like crazy to me. I don't know if the kilograms are different there, but, but he, he's, you know, he's ranked number one in the world right now. The next guy below him is 
like 40 pounds less. Uh, and he's a Russian dude. Uh, I'm ranked number five or six in the world right now. Uh, so I'm pretty happy about that. That's pretty crazy to me. I, a year ago, I would have never thought that could happen. Uh, but that that guy doing 465, and he's only, I think he's only 35 or 36. So he's still got four or five more years left in this division. So I can't imagine what he's going to be doing if he sticks with it. Like he'll, he'll probably put up 500 pounds eventually at this weight class, which that's just that. Hey, man, that, that's impressive. <laughs> Wow, so you're looking at four weeks out, right? Uh, seven, seven. I'm, I'm four weeks out. Yeah. All right. Seven weeks. It's going to be a tough, a tough seven weeks coming up. Yeah. Uh, so next week, I'll probably start using calibrated plates. Usually about six weeks out, I switch over to calibrated because uh, it is different. I don't care what anybody says. Calibrated plates are different. Uh, <laughs> it, it's a different lift. Uh, I learned that the hard way when I switched over the first time. I was like, man, I could do four or five in the gym with these 45 pound mm-hmm. weights, but man, 380 with these calibrated weights, that's heavy. So, uh, but uh, I, I've gotten used to them now, uh, you know, training with them a couple of times and it's not as difficult as a lift anymore. Um, but definitely, you know, uh, I love the competition. I love training for them. Uh, most people don't compete this soon after a competition. I think I, I had 10 weeks, you know, after my last competition, I was 10 weeks to the next one. Well, you're very new in the sport, but there's people that call them trophy hounds that like, you will stick go to every competition and they, they enter into every category and they walk away with like 20 trophies. Yeah. Which, hey, that, you know, if they want to do that, I think it's probably not good for your body in the long run. Uh, everybody needs rest. And they're all just naturally strong people out there who don't need the rest. And uh, I'm not sure, you know, like I said, I've got this competition and then I'll, this will qualify me for nationals in November. Uh, probably I, I won't compete again until November, I think, which kind of is going to suck because I like to compete. Uh, yeah. But I don't know. I might take a month off from training. I, I still, I'll still work out, but I won't train the way I've been training. I'll give my body a rest, but we might just keep the schedule and just keep working till November. Uh, it's, it'll be up to my coach. July, August, right? September, October, November, four months. Yeah. yeah that's great. I, I think like three meets a year is the most. I, th- I think that's 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 a perfect amount of time to train. Yeah. Yeah, yeah man. So, hey, okay. I'll let you go. I know you got you got to talk to your son. And- yeah, yeah. It's about that time. But it was great meeting you, man. Great chatting with you. Uh, uh, hey, listen, just uh, you know, let me know what happens at the competition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, let me know how yours goes too, man. You know, uh, are you doing full full uh, all all of your lifts or just one? Yeah, I'm doing full power and strict curl. So four 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 lifts. Man, that's a lot of lifts. Yeah. Normally, they do it like the night before. They'll do the strict curl, like with the early weigh-ins. And then the, the, but this one is because the guy's uh, an Orthodox Jewish guy. So oh, yeah. on Saturday night, the way So it's yeah. things on Sunday. So. All right. Well, I, mean, I hope you do well. And, uh, you know, keep in touch. If you ever want to chat again, I'm available. Uh, Thanks, man. Look forward to it. Thank you, man. You have a great night, Mike.